And welcome, everybody, to our Technology Council, the Greater New Haven Chamber of Commerce, as we present to you a program today on AI up to date with technology with our council. I'm Ray Andrews, and I'm the Executive Director of the Quinnipiac Chamber of Commerce. We're the affiliate chamber of the Greater New Haven Chamber of Commerce. And we want to thank Unipen, our sponsor, uh, who is going to help us navigate everything that we do with this Technology Council uh, as we talk for the next hour about some of the things uh, that you need to know uh, about the uh, technology at hand, uh, artificial intelligence and AI propelling your business and organization's growth. Before we bring in and welcome our guests, I'd like to uh, also thank our Technology Council sponsor, Unipen. And joining us from Unipen, welcome us all here today is Joan Walker. Joan, welcome. Thank you very much and welcome to everybody. Um, we are proud sponsors of the Technology Council of the Great New Hamburg Chamber and Affiliates. We're an organization of like-minded people who are in the technology field that want to advance information out to our public. Um, Unipen started over 30 years ago. We've been in the business of um, ensuring that you do uh, your, your organization works more efficiently and your organization more, works more securely. And how do we do that? By more efficiently, we take data from various parts of your organization and help to combine it so that you have a better presentation level and a better uh, working knowledge of what is going on within your organization. And by securely, our IT complete group makes sure that your um, network and your um, computers are secure and uh, are working for you and not against you with hackers coming in. Um, one of the things I was thinking about this morning was that 30 years ago, over 30 years ago, we bought our first server. And that server has had less capabilities than anyone's phone today. Technology evolution has really brought about a change on how people look at data, how people um, and organizations respond um, to their clients and utilize that data. And Unipen has been a part of that um, for over 30 years. So with AI in its infancy in many of the technology um, that you're about to be looking at is in the infancy stage in many industries. Other industries, it's very advanced and in, in, in certain industries, it's very much at the infancy stage. So we're really looking forward to learning more and to be able to present the information here today and to see how you folks think that this may impact your organization going forward. We hope you enjoy the webinar and thank you for coming. Thank you, Joan, and thank you, uh, Unipen, uh, for all you do to help provide programming like this and information uh, that is so vital to so many of our businesses. Thanks again. Well, it's time to welcome in our two uh, guests who are going to be taking it away uh, with everything, uh, all things artificial intelligence, using AI for your business and for your organization. I'd like to welcome in Jack Marchese. He's the founder, current uh, AI. Jack, it's great to have you here. Thanks thank you. for being with us. And Rock. Natalie, too, that's the CEO and the founder of Easy, uh, who's with us. So, Rock, thanks again for joining us here today. Thanks for And having with me. this, I'd like to turn over the program to Jack and to Rock. We're going to walk you through for the next 30 minutes this presentation. We are going to welcome your questions. Uh, all of your questions you can put yeah. in the chat or the Q&A. And we're going to be answering those questions in about 30 minutes from now. So on the back end of this hour, that's where we want you to um, ask your questions prepare them at that point. And I also want to mention that this program is recorded. We'll have this up on the Greater New Haven Chamber of Commerce YouTube channel so you can access this for further information. So with that, I say take it away, Jack and Rock. Yeah, thank you so much for the introduction again. My name is Jack Marchese. I'm the founder of a software startup called Current AI. And our mission is to use AI technology to help businesses discover what's trending in their industry and stay ahead of the curve. So for example, you can see on our slide here, you can enter anything on our software tool, uh, whatever's in your industry, whether that be a topic, a product or a brand, and we'll try and find trends for that industry for your topic. Um, and so we can really use AI to help speed up that market research process. Uh, so, you know, I've been involved with AI for a little while now, so super excited to meet you guys and to be able to talk about AI today and I'll hand it over to Rock. Thanks, Jack. So my name is Rock Vitale. I'm the founder and CEO of Easy. We're a single source implementation for, firm for growing businesses. And so the way we work is we're a network of specialists that are centrally managed to complete advanced projects. So we've done a lot of work in uh, AI throughout the past few years, but we work in about 40 different 
industries where uh, our clients send us projects. We review the project and create a custom team and custom quote for that. And then we complete the project according to custom requirements. So we've completed over 600 projects to date, uh, which um, has been interesting. And uh, so, yeah. All right, yeah, now that the uh, shameless plugs are out of the way here, we'll dive into the presentation. Uh, so we did cover this a little bit, but just go over again. So we're going to be covering a lot of information in a very short amount of time here. Could be a little overwhelming, but just stick with us. Uh, Rewatching the presentation is definitely encouraged, so that will be recorded. All resources and tools will be linked. We have a cut deck slide for that at the end that you can see. Q&A will be at the end. And all the tools we'll be talking about, we don't have any affiliation with, so let's dive right in. First thing is image generation. So that's using tools like Dolly, Bing, and Midjourney for generating images. This can be used for a variety of things for logos, social media, product packaging, UI, UX, photo editing on existing photos. Uh, so let's go in on this first example here. And Rock, if you want to kind of chime in as well as we go through this, you're more than welcome to. So for this first example, this is for logo ideas, right? So I don't know how well you can see this prompt, but we basically told Dolly to create a logo for a social media company called X. So, you know, pretty straightforward prompt here. You can see this is what it uh, was able to generate here. Uh, this is really just great for ideation. If you're not really too sure where you want to start, you know, what your logo might look like, you're really just looking for ideas. It's, it's great for that ideation, for that starting point. Um, so, you know, again, we didn't really do any other prompting beyond it's a social media company called X, give us some logos, right? And some of these are actually pretty good out of the box, um, but, you know, you probably want to do some, some tweaking as well. Uh, for the next slide, we're talking about social media content. This is a big one. This is probably what you guys are seeing a lot. This is really starting to take over the social media sphere, if you will. Uh, and so this is using that tool called Midjourney, which it's it's a little awkward to interact with because you have to use a, a messaging app called Discord to query it. Uh, but you can see in this example prompt, we said dogs in reindeer costumes, and you can see it created an incredibly lifelike. I mean, you wouldn't know this was generated by AI. It looks pretty much just like a picture. Uh, so you know, you say your prompt. In this case, again, it was dogs in reindeer costume. And once you give your prompt to Midjourney. It'll give you about six different outputs uh, that you can look through. Um, so, you know, this was one, for example, and if you say very strong or very subtle, there's things you can click if you want to basically, you know, regenerate an image or if you want to zoom in on it or zoom out on it. So it's really helpful for just creating social media content at scale. Uh, next thing is product packaging here. This is really useful, again, um, if you weren't really, again, too sure what you were really looking for out of your product packaging, but if you, again, have an idea about what your aesthetic and your ambiance will be. So in this case, we just gave an example prompt of, you know, we're selling cookies with an Eastern, uh, you know, kind of vibe to it. And you can see this is, is what it came up with. So if you have physical products, obviously it's not limited to just uh, cookies here, you know, whatever your product is, it can help you generate some of that. Uh, the last example that I think is really helpful too is in UI UX designs, so whether you have a software application or you have some websites. Again, if you look closely, the text in this is complete gibberish, uh, but that's not really the uh, point that, you know, of, of what you're trying to do here. So really, again, the point is ideation. And if you, uh, if you interface with the AI and tell it the kind of style you're looking for, so in this case, we said, you know, a fast food delivery app, it can really give you some different iterations and some versions of things that you can use to really get down the aesthetic that, you know, if, if you're a UI UX designer, you can use this as a jumping off point. Or if you have a UI UX team and you're having a hard time communicating what exactly you're looking for. And I know that back and forth communication can be very frustrating at times. This can be that kind of first buffer uh, for you to, to be able to hand over to your design team. Uh, and I'll hand it over to Rock. We'll talk a little bit about some cool things you can do with Adobe. Awesome. Thanks, Jack. So um, one of the coolest things we've seen with uh, photo editing and image generation in general has come out of Adobe. They released a beta product recently called Adaptive Fill, where you can take existing photos, as you can see here in the slide, and you can generate uh, modifications or even, you know, complete additions to the photo uh, in seconds. And so these are things that historically would have taken um, you know, hours or days for a designer to complete. And now it speeds up the design process with high degree of quality. So you can see, you know, just typing items into the uh, the prompt field here where 
in this photo, for example, they're trying to add a frozen lake to this, this landscape photo. You can see how hyper-realistic it looks. And so uh, really interesting kind of uh, diverse applications that can come out of uh, image generation. One thing to note um, that Jack kind of alluded to is there's a few different popular image generation uh, frameworks. And so the two that are kind of the most mainstream are called DALI and Midjourney. And so um, generally, if you're looking for more hyper-realistic or almost, uh, for lack of a better word, production level photos, Midjourney generally tends to perform better. So you can see here between these two uh, photos on the left, we've got DALI 2, which produced almost a more uh, cartoonish kind of output compared to Midjourney there on the right. And we can see the identical prompt that we used here at the bottom of the screen. Um, and so DALI 2 generally is used more for ideation and kind of brainstorming and Midjourney is more helpful for, you know, final product or, or close to final product. And so um, a few things here uh, in terms of the best practices for image generation, we suggest being as specific as possible. So going back to this last slide, we can see we put a very specific prompt here. Uh, you know, it has a lot of detail. And if you give the AI the most specific information you can about what you're looking for, it generally can per perform better. What's interesting too, is you can request things in certain styles. So for example, if you wanted to make uh, an image that was in the style of a Van Gogh painting, for example, that's, that's the kind of detail you could provide. Another thing that can be helpful if you're not getting the output that you're looking for is to use something called a negative prompt. So uh, for example, um, saying don't use the color red uh, would be an example of a negative prompt. And if you can tell the AI the use case for the image that you're trying to generate, then it can uh, sometimes perform with a little more uh, specificity where it's giving you kind of industry specific results. Um, and play around with it. You know, experimentation and kind of fine tuning your uh, input will give you the best outputs. And so there's a little bit of kind of uh, R&D that, that you would need to do as part of this process. Um, okay, so we are going into uh, the next section, which is related to content creation. So we've got a few applications here that we will uh, show as examples, but this is one of the more kind of common things that comes to mind when people are thinking about AI in the current state. So a lot of people think about things like chat GPT, being able to, you know, write a blog post or edit some text or, um, you know, generate a script or some email ideas. And uh, so generating content uh, outside of images and generating content as text is definitely a rapidly growing field. So, so we'll use some uh, examples here in this section. So the first example is uh, using AI for automated outbound emails for sales purposes. So this was actually something that Easy created. Uh, it was called Deep Puppet, where we were able to create hyper-personalized emails for uh, different target companies that we were trying to work with. And, you know, historically to write a personalized email that, you know, knew in detail what the target company did, knew in detail, you know, what we did, and also... Um, had a relevant message that was personalized to them would have taken relatively significant amount of time, probably 15 to 30 minutes of, of research. But through this, we were able to create these hyper-personalized emails at scale, including follow-up functionality um, that you can generate in about a minute or so. So it was really interesting uh, kind of seeing the results of that. Another thing- And if I could, Rock, if I could just piggyback on that too real quick, what's really cool about this is you can even use AI to analyze a potential leads website as well. Uh, so if you know you just build a lead list of people you know you want to acquire, you can have an AI actually go through their website and then write, you know, again, an email like this. So, you know, or, or if they were featured in something or they're really proud about something that just launched or, you know, whatever their key talking points are on the homepage, you can use AI to automatically analyze that website and then help you generate an email like this, which is really cool. That's a really good point, Jack. And that's that's like a, a big element of how this works is you just have to put in something like the company website. And uh, Jack kind of alluded to this as well, but you can you can give the system information that is even more relevant. Like I saw that this person was on the CNBC's Disruptor 50 list. And so um, it's pretty flexible while also high performing. And so it's, it's pretty interesting kind of seeing email as one of the kind of initial 
sort of low hanging fruits that we saw a lot of adoption with uh, when the AI kind of text generation first became more mainstream. Um, the next example, uh, a little bit whimsical of an example, but uh, we can also take an image and convert it into text. And so in this case, it's a little more of like a cheeky example where we've got this picture of a pug in a raincoat. And uh, just through that single image, we're able to generate a story uh, called The Pug's Rainy Day Adventure. And so, you know, it's interesting because, um, you know, not only does the uh, system know that it's a pug and that it's a dog, but also that it's wearing a raincoat. And so, um, you know, the ability to understand context, object recognition, and sort of using what's called computer vision to then generate, um, you know, compelling text is really interesting. And there's a lot of applications you can think of for this that aren't as, as whimsical, that might be a little more serious, like, you know, um, detecting certain uh, objects in a screen. So it's something even like search and rescue, disaster recovery, um, you know, or even monitoring uh, room occupancy to make sure that you're up to fire code. A lot of different things you can think of uh, in terms of image to text generation. And then uh, we've got a, a video that we're going to show here momentarily um, that shows a, a AI generated uh, video and AI generated voice uh, as, as our next example here. So I'll just play that. Greetings to the New Haven Chamber members. It's me, Chris Kringle. I hope you're paying attention to Jack and Rock's presentation. If not, you'll be getting coal in your stocking this Christmas. Warm regards, Santa. Okay, thank you, Santa. So as you can see, we generated greetings uh, to the we generated an AI Santa that created a video. Um, and so in terms of video generation, there's, you know, that could be a whole presentation in itself, but a lot of benefits for using AI for something like training videos for your employees. Um, first of all, you can generate content much faster. You don't need any video equipment. You can scale up production rapidly and make tweaks if needed. So no need to, you know, do reshoots or, uh, you know, do a bunch of changes in post. People are much more likely to pay attention when uh, videos are, uh, you know, personalized and relevant. And so in terms of, you know, generating video, you don't uh, need to even use something like a Santa. You can actually do things like uh, use your employees' faces uh, if they consent to, or use a uh, celebrity space or use, you know, uh, voices and faces of people that are actually relevant to your organization. Um, side point two that's kind of interesting is this isn't limited to human beings too. So you can make videos of that look like people talking even for things like animals or objects. And so uh, a lot of interesting use cases there. Uh, then the final thing I'll talk on before I pass it back to Jack is personalization is really a huge element of um, value that AI can create. And so personalization really is key that you can get much higher return on investment if you have personalization in your things like your outreach or your general content. When people feel like the messaging is, rel is relevant to them and actually has an element of, uh, you know, research about who they are, they're much more likely to pay attention to it. And so you, using that uh, in the context of AI technology, you could integrate something uh, AI related into, for example, your customer relationship management system. So it can send messages, dynamic audio, video, or text for things like uh, follow-ups, birthdays, um, you know, specific types of events, specific types of triggers that are related to, you know, custom properties of your customers. And so you can imagine kind of creative ways to approach this, but being able to program these things to uh, exist kind of independently gives you these, this really powerful, scalable way to uh, engage with your uh, users. And I would just say too, Rock, as, as far as with marketing purposes too, with personalization, you guys know how hard it can be sometimes uh, to connect with customers with how saturated marketing is, right? Um, you know, you're getting email blasts, you're getting a lot of uh, generic things that aren't, you don't feel like they're made specifically for you. And in that case, you don't want to engage or interact. But I mean, imagine, yeah, and let's just with the AI Santa video, for example, right? If it's Christmas time and your CRM knows that you've been a customer for a year, if 
you got a personalized video from Santa Claus that knew your name and was thanking you for, you know, being a customer with us for a year. That could be like, it could be funny, but it could also be really powerful and something that sticks with you. That's something you're going to remember. And, you know, in, in an age right now where it's so hard for businesses to break through all that noise and all that competition when it comes to marketing and share a voice, doing little tweaks like this where it's not expensive and it's not a crazy thing to set up and implement can really go a long way. And so if nothing else, this is a great opportunity for you guys to brainstorm how you can use technology like this to create uh, unique and new experiences for your customers. Great point, Jack. And uh, I'll pass it back to you for our next slide. Yeah, thank you. So this is kind of my bread and butter. This is the stuff I love talking about. And so this is data analysis. So one of the tools we're going to be talking about is Claude 2 and how you can use Claude tool to analyze uh, uh, text for summarization and sentiment. Uh, so uh, Claude 2, for a little bit of context, is a, a chat GPT competition or a competitor, if you will. Um, so this is just an example data set that we had right here. So I had this CSV file. This is a real Amazon product review. It was this little head scratcher thing here I had for motivation. Uh, so I went to that product. I scraped, you know, just a sample of those reviews. So you can see the review counts in this example uh, data set, the rating on a one to five scale, right? One low rating, high is five rating. And then the text or the actual review that was associated with that. So if we go to the next slide here, you can see I uploaded that CSV into Claude and I gave it this prompt just saying I've uploaded some data. Uh, this is product review data from Amazon. So I'm telling the AI the context of what this data set is that it's looking at. I'm saying, you know, it's the one to five star rating. It has a written view. Can you summarize this data for me? So I didn't even ask it, you know, anything crazy. Just can you give me a, a brief summary, uh, summary here? And you can see it did some basic things that you can get from a pivot table, like the review counts, the average rating. Uh, but it can also do some really cool things, too. You can see from these other examples where it actually analyzed the one and two star reviews and figured out what people were saying in those reviews that they didn't like about that product. Looking at the high reviews, what did they like? And then some of the middle reviews. And so you can use this information, you can imagine, not just for your own physical product, right, but even... If you have Google reviews, if you want to import that data, that data can be scraped from Google. Or if you have competitors, right? So whether, again, if, if there's reviews of your competitors that exist and you want to do some quick market analysis and try to figure out, are there any gaps in the market? What are people saying about your comp uh, about the competition where maybe they're lacking and it might you know, be a value add or something you can do for your own business? And so when it comes to, to analyzing data and, and, and summarizing data, there's obviously way more things you can use with just uh, than just review data. But I think this is a really quick and powerful example of just things you can use where just with a simple question of, can you summarize this data for me? You can see you got some really incredible insights. Now imagine doing that at scale and doing that with other data that you have uh, within your database. Um, so last point I'll make on Claude 2 on the next slide here is that it's trained on more recent data for the, than chat GPT. Uh, so this is relevant for data analysis, but also just kind of general things for LLMs, like just interfacing with the AI. So you can see we asked on the top, this is Claude, and on the bottom, this is ChatGPT. Just a very simple question of who owns Twitter, right? You can see Claude was correct, and it says as of September 2022, it's owned by Elon Musk. It had the correct information for how much the company was purchased for. Uh, and then on the bottom, when we asked ChatGPT, you can see that training data only goes up to September 2021, so it didn't have that information. So this is just something to keep in mind from my personal experience, especially with what I do with trends. It's very important for me to have the most up-to-date and relevant information. And so if that's something that's very important to you guys, then we would recommend using Claude. And they also do have their own API if you need to interface with that for your software or any web application you might be uh, developing. So just a kind of a, a cool thing to keep in mind. Uh, and then I'll hand it over to Rock, who will talk about data extraction for analysis. Jack loves Claude compared to ChatGPT. <laughs> um, and one thing I think to Jack's point is like, uh, you know, when you're thinking about large language models and kind of, you know, what's kind of sort of captured the public's imagination with things like ChatGPT, when you're comparing things like Claude and ChatGPT, like Jack said, there's an element of uh, training that needs to go into each version of these models. So these models are trained on large amounts of data and in this case text um, to kind of have the information that it does. It's not a database, it's rather uh, statistics 
statistical relationships between words and sort of being able to predict the next word based on the data that it's trained on. So even cloud uh, only is trained up to February of 2023. And so one way to sort of mitigate the fact that these models aren't always in real time up to date with historical events is you can set up systems where you can dynamically pass data to it to give it context. And so that's a way to kind of control a little bit for this sort of trailing uh, historical um, knowledge. But yeah, cloud is great too. I like cloud as well. Um, so then, uh, you know, when we're talking about AI products, I think a lot of people in sort of the recent months have really been captured by this idea of text generation, image generation, sort of this like chat bot type thing. But one of the things we really want to make clear in this presentation is there's uh, substantially more applications outside of just text and, and language that can be, um, you know, utilized by AI. And so computer vision is one that uh, historically we've seen a lot of interest in. And so this uh, slide that we're showing you here, this was a software product that Easy created for a financial client where they were dealing with a large volume of invoices every every month. They had to deal with something like 10,000 invoices. And historically, they were uh, using a CSV uh, to manually enter the data. And they would have a specialist, um, you know, a poor soul that has to manually enter the data uh, for 10,000 files. And so there was a huge amount of human-based manual entry involved in this. And so this system uh, made it so you could upload as many documents as you wanted. And using computer vision, we were able to pull data out of these documents automatically, regardless of the format. So we're able to pull things like the tax, the total, all the vendors, the uh, you know the invoice date, the, the payment terms. And what was cool about this is that, again, it was not related to the format of the invoice. So you could upload 10,000 different formats and it would still work with a high degree of confidence. And so it's very different from historical technology like OCR, where you needed to know the positioning in advance of the different fields. And so, you know, being able to extract data out of documents um, is super powerful application that we're starting to see a lot of adoption in. Um, and so besides financial documents, you can also do extraction on other types of files as well, like driver's licenses. Um, so a lot of, a lot of possibility there. Another one that uh, we've seen a lot of interest in is user generated uh, content moderation. So if you have a website that people can submit comments or people can post things publicly um, or really enter any user generated comment that you may want to uh, have some type of moderation around, you can use AI to evaluate the text based on uh, moderation criteria. So you can see here in the screenshot that um, you can flag the uh, input that you put in based on these different categories. So if something is you know, hateful or threatening or violent, um, or sexual or related to self-harm, you can uh, flag that for saying either, you know, hiding it from the view of the public or to say, hey, uh, this one's been flagged that needs additional review from a human being. So um, you can imagine all the different applications. And in fact, we, um, we just created a game application for a nonprofit where there's uh, thousands of user generated uh, stories that need to be sort of reviewed. And, and we put this moderation in here uh, to help the moderators kind of cut down all the manual process that they would need to do there. And so a huge amount of applications in this as well, um, where if anybody's done any moderation before, you can appreciate how extremely time consuming this once was when it was a person needing to do all of this. And um, the only other thing I'll emphasize about this is that this isn't based on keywords. This is again, based on statistical relationships between the words. So if you just put like a piece of profanity in there, that wouldn't necessarily trigger it. It's more how it would be the profanity in the context of the larger sentence. So it's, it's quite interesting and I, I won't get too philosophical about it, but it's-, it's Well, I would just say rock too, just to add on that briefly, a big thing in marketing that you know we've seen in 2022, 2023 and beyond is people really trying to build an audience and do community building as a core way of trying to, to grow their business. And so, you know, like, for example, I have a Facebook group of a little over 8,000 people, but there, you know, there's people that have, uh, you know, their own platforms where there are or, or Reddit threads and things like that, where there's so much content that can be coming in. And it's a really large ask, especially as a small business, as you're trying to grow to try to 
uh, you know, manage all of the comments and all of the content that's trying to come in. And so, you know, especially if you're trying to create an inclusive community or a community that follows certain guidelines and standards, you know, it doesn't just have to be moderating on, you know, things like hate or violence, you know, there, there's other, you can set up any parameter you want to try to make sure it's, um, not, not only flagging things, but maybe also even rewarding certain people as well for, for how they're they're engaging within your community. So it's just another use case and an interesting way to try to think about how you can try to automate some of these things to not only monitor how people are, are engaging in your community, but to also try and reward those people who are valuable members of your community as well. I think that's a really good point, Jack, that um, you know this sort of out-of-the-box moderation capability that you can get is often just a single layer in sort of the algorithm that reviews these different submissions. And so if you have, you know, specific terms of use with uh, your, your business, for example, say you're a staffing agency and there's restrictions about how, you know, your uh, people that you staff for a project can talk to your customers about, you know, W2 relationships versus contractor types of relationships. Um, it's an, an example would be like, if they're talking about cutting your staffing agency out and then just sort of working together separately. That's even something you could train AI to, to moderate and to check out. And so I'm talking a little more about punitive things, but to Jack's point, you can use it for, for rewards as well. Um, okay, so then next topic is uh, related to software engineering and web design. And so this is, this is a really interesting one where uh, people, that are in the technology space, you're starting to see a lot of um, the preponderance of things like co-pilot types of systems where you have engineers that are writing code that are chatting and interacting with uh, AI on a regular basis throughout their business day. And so what's interesting is that, you know, you can use something like ChatGPT to not only generate code from scratch where you could say like, you know, build me a single page application in React Native that does X, Y, Z, where you could output that. But you can also take your existing code and uh, AI can help you debug it. And so in this example here, we uh, had a React Native app that we were creating that uh, was having some issues with how it was displaying. And so we used ChatGPT in this case to debug it. And uh, it generally works with a pretty high degree of success. And so it's quite interesting. You can use it not only for debugging, but also just for brainstorming best approaches for, um, you know, writing different types of code, microservices, or even setting up cloud-based infrastructure. And so it's, it's quite fascinating indeed. And then uh, pass it to Jack. Thank you. Yeah. So I'm going to introduce you guys very briefly to Microsoft Clarity. So if this is a tool you guys aren't using in your business, I strongly, strongly recommend implementing it. It's just a snippet of code you need to embed into your website, totally free to use. And so what it does is it records how people are using your website. And so you can see in this example here, there's a heat map and uh, this is just how the mouse moves around the screen. So you can see the area where, where there's more red, that just means you know on average more people are, are putting their mouse in that area. There's also click maps, so where are people clicking? scroll maps or scroll depth. So how how much are people scrolling through your website? And so, you know, this technology has existed for a little while. So you might be wondering, okay, what's the AI component of this? Well, that's on the next slide here uh, where you can actually use insights. So what it does is the AI will actually watch the, the session and then it'll give you a summary of what it saw. And so you can imagine it can allow you to basically, ra rather than having to watch all the sessions, It'll uh, be in a text output of everything it saw, but not just that, but help you analyze it. So, you know, for example, if you set up triggers, like maybe a conversion event, if they go to your pricing page, for example, and they don't check out. So, you know, this, this AI will actually know that without any setup, it'll understand it's a pricing page. And it might say, for example, the user was on your pricing page for 20 seconds, and then they clicked off to another screen. And then it will say, you know, that could mean they were confused or they were frustrated. This thing wasn't clear. And so it can really help you analyze website trends at scale, especially you know, if you have a funnel-based system where you have people at the top of the funnel going into your website, you need to try to optimize the amount of people that are converting on your website. It's a really powerful thing to not only understand or, or see like on something like a heat map where people are more likely to, to bring their mouse to, but on the AI components, you know, taking this text and, and outputting it and then analyzing it so you can see, okay, 
on our pricing page, it looks like most a lot of people are confused or they go to the home page and then they leave. So our bounce rate is high, but they didn't scroll that far down. So maybe we need to tweak our design a little bit. And so you can, you know, kind of use this to understand how people are interacting with your website. And if you're, you know, an e-commerce business or you do a lot of your business through your website where that's your kind of your, your main revenue engine, then, you know, having something like this and having these systems in place where you can analyze these things at scale uh, is something that's incredibly important. Uh, and so I think the last thing we're going to talk about today before we get into Q&A is manufacturing and compliance. And I will hand that over to Rock. Thanks, Jack. And yeah, I think a, a, lar a large theme of, of this presentation so far has really been kind of like what Jack was just saying, where not only are you, are you able to gather data and sort of analyze it in a rapid way, but um, the context and being able to have actually actionable insights from these things, uh, it's extremely powerful. And uh, so going into manufacturing and compliance, uh, we've got a few examples here uh, that I will just dive into. So uh, here is a video in this slide of me when I had longer hair, where we created an application for a manufacturing client where essentially they wanted to create a system that could automatically recognize personal protective equipment in a video stream. And so that would be used for uh, essentially compliance purposes. So you can imagine historically you'd have a health and safety officer that would be uh, basically physically monitoring to make sure people were wearing, say, a hard hat in a manufacturing center. So if you're in kind of the health and safety field, you know how time consuming these things can be. Um, you're spot checking things. You're not able to see things, you know, in real time necessarily. So what this system did is it would automatically be able to tell what type of PPE people were wearing, how many people were in the room, um, and if somebody removed their PPE. And so you can imagine you can set triggers to, for example, take a screenshot in the video and send a push notification to the foreman if somebody's not wearing a hard hat. And so not only you know would that help with things like OSHA compliance, but also uh, in avoiding injuries and potentially even uh, death on the manufacturing floor, not to be dramatic. Um, next example, um, you can use a software called Wiz to automatically run compliance checks on your cloud infrastructure. So if you're using something like AWS or Azure or Google Cloud, you can get uh, pretty much unprecedented visibility into your tech stack um, and conduct automatic compliance checks for things like uh, HIPAA or SOC 2. And so if you're in a highly regulated uh, in business environment, or even if you're not, you're just using cloud computing services, this uh, is seeing rapid adoption for uh, compared to what was previously a, a relatively manual process where you had to... Um, you know, basically configure alerts and uh, semi-manually run compliance checks. So Wiz, uh, definitely interesting little backstory there, which I won't go into at this time, but um, super cool. And then finally, uh, another manufacturing example. So you can use a uh, high-speed camera combined with computer vision technology to automatically d detect uh, defects in uh large scale manufacturing processes. So you can see in this uh, example, you have uh, computer chips being manufactured where uh, on the left hand side, you have a defective component that has slightly bent pins there on the left side. And then on the right side, uh, the right image, rather the second image, you have a um, uh, component that's conforming to the specifications where the pins are not bent. And so you can upload, you know, even just 20 or so photos of what uh, good parts and bad parts look like, and then uh, you can automatically detect if there are defects. And so you can imagine that would increase quality in manufacturing, but also uh, decrease the manual activity needed for your QA process. So super fascinating stuff there as well. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, kind of our closing slide here is just when you're working with AI, just some kind of general best practices. The first thing is mastering the art and the science of prompt engineering. So whenever you're interacting with the AI, uh, there's always going to be some kind of uh, prompt that needs to be written. So basically that's you communicating or, or uh, typing to the AI. So prompt engineering is actually its own job now. So, you know, if you go on Indeed and you look at all these job boards, there's businesses that are actively hiring uh, for prompt engineers. And essentially what this job is, is it's people who are hired to try to figure out how to, to interface with the AI to get the most out of it for whatever their business is. So this is a really growing field. Um, 
So, you know, it's you're, you're whenever you're talking to an AI, very rarely are you going to get the output you're looking for the first, second, sometimes maybe even third time. And so, you know, what's nice about something like ChatGPT or Claude is it has that memory. So as you're you're talking to it within that single thread, it can look back at, at earlier points in a conversation. So it can kind of learn about what specifically you're looking for. And it can, you can adapt that over time, which is really nice for, you know, whatever your, your business use case might be. Um, there's also way more to AI than chat GPT, as you saw from this presentation. I know that's kind of the one that has the, the stranglehold on the market right now. And when people think of AI, they think of chat GPT, just because of their, again, huge market share. Uh, but, you know, we showed you a few tools there. There's tools. The market is probably going to be coming saturated pretty soon with, with AI tools that, uh, they're going to be existing. So, you know, don't be afraid to just explore and see what's out there for whatever your use case is. Um, cause like I said, there's way more than just chat GPT out there. Uh, also last, but certainly not least is making sure you're doing a manual review of all AI generated content. Um, so, you know, especially this is important if you're trying to do fact-based blog writing, for example, or you have, uh, things where you're trying to be e create educational content. For example, you want to make sure the things you're writing about are actually true or else obviously that's not going to be good for your credibility. Uh, so, you know, whatever you're, you're writing about, or you're creating there, at least early on, there definitely should be a heavy manual process and you know maybe it's like a facebook post that's being generated and you're integrating with something like hootsuite where you have an ai creating your content for you it's uploaded to hootsuite and then hootsuite is automatically publishing your content on facebook you know twitter instagram whatever platforms you might use for your business um, but definitely recommend having a, a social media manager or whoever you know kind of reviews the social media content in-house just make sure everything is appropriate and accurate to avoid hallucinations, which is basically just a phenomenon where the AI will very confidently be wrong. Uh, so just kind of making sure that uh, that it's correct. And I mean, sometimes you can even when you're talking to chat GPT, for example, you can tell it that it's wrong and it'll be, oh, I'm sorry, I, I am wrong. I realize that now. But, you know, it would have been nice to realize that before you went to use that information. Uh, so just kind of things to, to keep in mind. Um, and then, yeah, that's going to conclude our presentation here. Um, we do have a few slides to show you just because when we, we send this uh, deck out to you. Uh, so the first thing is contacting us, obviously, if you want to contact either of us for questions about our businesses or integrating AI into your own business. I know Rock and both myself are, are happy to help you out in any, any way that we can. Um, and then if we go down one more, you can see the, the resource cut sheet. So all the tools we talked about during this presentation, it was a lot of them, as you can see. Uh, but you know, again, this presentation was recorded, so you can refer back to it and you'll have this slide deck as well. So you can refer to this slide and you can click on it if you want to use Dolly or Midjourney or make your own SAN AI, you know, kind of anything you saw in this presentation. If you want to try it out, the, uh, the links are directly here. Um, and so, yeah, that's our uh, presentation. I know we have some chamber events, so I can uh, pass it off and then we can get into some Q&A. That sounds excellent. And we do go through a few of the events that we have. Rock and Jack, it's excellent. Uh, appreciate everything that you have provided us here today. Um, before we get into our question and answer, I'm just going to do a couple of things. We do have a couple of chamber events coming up. Uh, and I want to mention these. And we'll slide through these. And then I'm going to introduce Ed Tankus from Alliance Technologies, who's chair of our technology council. Uh, coming up on Saturday in North Haven, we have the North Haven Festival and Business Expo. It's a free event from 11 to 4. A lot of food, we have a lot of music, we have classic cars, we have the kids zone, we have over 60 vendors who are going to be there from a variety of businesses around the greater uh, North Haven area. This is a free event, except for the food. Uh, so come on down. It's free parking all around the uh, center of North Haven on the North Haven Green. Uh, that's coming up on Saturday. Other events that we have coming up here with our Chamber of Commerce um, that we want to tell you about, too, if we can advance the slide uh, just a little bit. Jack is the Big Expo and the Big Connect. We will be doing a program on this, Jack and Rock, as you know. Uh, November 15th, that's going to be at the Omni Hotel in downtown New Haven. It's our premier business-to-business -business event. Go to gnhcc.com to learn more as our programming evolves. And uh, sign up for a booth right now for your business. We welcome you to showcase your booth in the greater New Haven area at this event. This is always well attended breakout rooms, lots of Q&A information, networking, and the Big Taste New Haven on November 15th. So those are some of the events that are coming up. Uh, and uh, we will be going over to Ed Tankus, I think now, and talking a little bit with our Technology Council Chair, Rockin. Uh, Jack, we'll get back to you. Thank you all for attending, but we're not done yet.
okay? GNHCC.com for booth information. GNHCC.com for booth information if you want to go online for the Big Connect. Now, let's get over to Ed Tankus before we slide back over to Rock and Jack. Ed is our Technology Council uh, Chair, and Ed Tankus from Alliant Technologies. Ed, uh, this has been a remarkable presentation from Rock and Jack. Oh, I agree, Ray. It's been very remarkable. Uh, kudos to both uh, you, Jack, and Rock. Thank you very much. Uh, it was a wonderful presentation. Um, I, uh, myself and Rain, I think uh, one or two others got to see a, a preview of this, but, you know, seen it uh, live uh, again and, and all the slides and so on. It's just an amazing presentation. So thank you again uh, for putting this out there and doing all the legwork that it required to uh, make this uh, presentation what it was. As Ray mentioned, um, I'm chair of the Technology Council. If you have an interest in technology in general, you don't have to have a technology background, but if you're interested in things like AI and other things, um, please reach out uh, to me or to Ray or to Glenn Arch or anyone at the chamber to get more information about uh, being a part of the Technology Council. And uh, also, uh, as Ray mentioned, as uh, part of the Big Connect, there will be an, another AI presentation. That'll be uh, the Big Connect November 15th, 2.30 to 3.30 p.m. Um, with Dr. J from the Quinnipiac University. This will be something very special. It's gonna be a hands-on AI workshop. So there's no sign up just yet. There's no more information than that yet, but that is coming and I'm pretty excited to um, participate in that. And I'm sure you will be as well. Um, and again, thank you for attending this um, seminar. There's going to be more to come. So, Ray, back to you. Okay. All right. Thanks, Ed. Uh, we do have a lot of questions for Rock and Jack right here. Um, we will be providing, if we can, I guess, Jack, one more time, the resource page. So you can bring that back up. There's been a couple of requests uh, so folks can maybe copy it down. Yeah. And if I could just comment on that, too. Again, you guys will be sent this exact deck. So, you know, you can actually see this deck for yourself. If you want to go through it, it's recorded to watch. But if you want to actually click on them and look at all the tools that we've listed here, you will have the ability to do that. We made this resource cut sheet slide just for you guys. Great. And Kate, who has a question, um, is it just answered it here. It is a lot of this been covered. This is a rewatch easily on our YouTube channel for the Greater New Haven Chamber of Commerce. So you can go there, watch it in real time, stop advance uh and and learn as we go along so the question actually from kate that we have uh, jack and rock is uh, a list of your favorite ai programs associated costs i guess uh kate's looking for your favorites if you choose to say what your favorites are wow well i mean for me personally i i mean i mentioned uh clarity you can't be free right um so again if you have a website you need to understand how people are going through your website definitely recommend that um Claude 2 and ChatGPT are both really nice. The one thing I will say is for ChatGPT, if you want to use thing uh, like if you want data analysis for ChatGPT, you do have to pay to use plugins, which is I think 20-ish dollars a month. Uh, but you know, there's it's something called code interpreter where it can analyze code, but you can also do data analysis on it as well. Um, you know, there's a bunch of these tools out there that exist. Um, the thing with Claude 2 is there is a limitation on their free tier. So, like, you know, how much you can communicate with it, where on uh, chat GPT, there, there's no limit. Um, if you do spend a little bit of extra money though to uh, on chat GPT using it, the, the chat GPT four model and not the turbo 3.5. So it's like it's advanced model. I've found it's much better at handling, you know, more advanced tasks, um, especially with what I do. I might, I have, you know, long prompts where, you know, the AI may need to follow six, seven, eight conditions. And the base tier of an AI model might struggle to, to make sure it's following all of those uh, conditions that I have set up for it. Um, so th those are just some of mine that I've listed in here that I really like and rock. I'm not sure if you have any that either we put in the presentation or maybe some we weren't able to get to today. Uh, for sure. And I would definitely echo what Jack was saying that, um, you know, there's there's a good amount of free tools out there. Clarity is pretty awesome. Um, but on top of the sort of stuff we've covered already, uh, ChatGPT has an API where you can, you know, integrate your software directly with it. And uh, that's that's hugely helpful for some of the software we've created recently that includes, uh, you know, text based sort of interaction and for uh you know that uh, that deep puppet email automation we we showed you for example we we're able to generate you know 
thousands of emails and spend, you know, less than $30 in a month. And so the output is something like 0.002. So it's like fractions of a cent per output kind of thing. And so the API is extremely scalable and uh, pretty cost effective. Um, the other thing I would say that uh, we kind of alluded to in this conversation is hugging face where that's actually a um, repository of open source uh, AI frameworks that you can integrate into your software. So many of them are free where you're just basically using the open source based models. Um, and so that, that can be extremely powerful if you're actually creating your own software. The only other thing I'll say is that um, a lot of cloud service providers like AWS and Google Cloud and Azure have their own AI libraries built in that are similarly um, low cost where you can do more specialized things like computer vision or uh, not just text-based kind of things. And so those uh, are definitely worth a shout out as well, specifically AWS recognition. Excellent. Um, I have a question here um, and, and we're going to get to a question about sort of the privacy issues, ethics, things of that nature. A couple of those questions are popping up right now. You can put your questions uh, if you're viewing here in the Q&A and we'll get to your questions as we move along. Specific industry, David asked about AI technical data development uh, with a construction company for construction estimating and detailed proposal writing. How can AI get be helpful in this regard? Yeah, so I'm, I'm seeing the question here. It was how can AI help with really technical data development such as construction estimating and detailed proposal writing? Um, Rock, if you wanna, I know this, this would probably be in your wheelhouse, some of this stuff. Sure. Uh, so we've actually done a, quite a bit of work in the construction industry. Uh, and I can say that, you know, part of what the sort of value of a system like this is the sort of input that you put in will very largely like affect the output that comes out. So to Jack's earlier point about how you can, you know, have these like multi-step kind of prompts where there's a bunch of different use cases and conditions, um, you can use that in you know, creative ways to produce pretty technical documentation where, you know, depending on, you know, what your proposal process looks like, you could even also upload a CSV kind of in um, combination with a, with an advanced prompt. So if you have, for example, like an algorithm or like a, you know, type of logic that you could summarize in something like a spreadsheet, you could upload that in combination with customer specific data to generate a uh, pretty advanced outputs. And so, um, you know, the scope of work, the information about the customer and, uh, you know, perhaps some data around what the deliverables, deliverables would be, you could get a pretty good kind of first draft out of it. It, it might need some tweaking to create like an actual final draft, but to do things that are, you know, math related or resource estimation related, uh, you definitely can uh, find some solutions with that. Um, but you would have to play around a little bit with what your prompt would be. Yeah. yeah, I think it ultimately depends to, you know, what your use case is and what exactly, you know, data development entails, right? Because that's kind of a, a, a broad term. Um, but, you know, I mean, we showed some examples too, where if you do have some data uh, that you can feed into an AI, you know, from a CSV and it can, you know, analyze it for you. Or I, I saw you had mentioned, uh, you know, detailed proposal or writing something that, chat GPT in both Claude are really good at is, is technical writing. Uh, sometimes it can be a little jargony or, you know, especially with proposal writing, but something that you can do is again, this, when it, this comes to prompt engineering, you can kind of tell the AI that your proposal writing style. And again, because it is kind of back and forth, you can give it feedback on, you know, maybe something it did well or something it didn't do well. And then when it comes to generating images, obviously, if you want to have a stunning proposal that you're, maybe it's like, like a, a PDF that you're emailing to the client, if they want a digital version of it or something like that, like you can use that, you can use AI to create really stunning visuals that can, you know, really overwhelm uh, the client's. Uh, to, to show that, you know, not just not not only is your construction work polished, but hey, look how clean this proposal is for our proposal is this clean and looks this good. Imagine how good our construction is. Right. So, I mean, it's just one of those things where it's more of like a branding point, ultimately. Um, but uh, yeah, I guess kind of a long winded way of saying it, it whatever you're trying to, to solve, there's probably some ways we can be creative to have AI either automate it completely or at least improve it or, uh, you know, optimize it in some way. One, one thing that I'll say too, kind of to, to Jack's point about actually creating like presentation assets is um, 
So, so this is in the process of being released, but uh, Microsoft Office and Google Workspace are both releasing their own like AI presentation assistants where, you know, not only can they help you, you know, analyze data and, you know, do things on spreadsheets, but you can also have AI, uh, you know, create presentations for you, uh, which is super interesting. Um, you can create maps, you can create tables, you can create, um, you know, executive summaries. So all of that is um, extremely useful. And um, the technical write-ups that you can get out of just simply uploading a CSV of data, uh, you know, just side point, we had a healthcare client that we asked this detailed questionnaire about their tech stack and we wanted it summarized into a write-up. And so we just uploaded the questionnaire and then we're able to get a pretty good first draft, like I said, out of the, uh, out of the system. So for technical writing, like Jack said, it's, it's hugely uh, good, but you, you do have to mess around a little bit with the prompt sometimes to make it so it doesn't sound bombastic. So there's so many uh, areas that we can cover. We talked about a lot of the technical, the how to and the, um, the real technology applications in this. But we do have a question from an attendee about the ethics privacy of it. And, and sort of, I think, those of us who have not um, used the new technology may be a little inhibited based on privacy concerns. The question is determining the ethical privacy concerns uh, and policies when using these new tools. Um, many train their models on scraped content that don't have author consent. Most mm -hmm. models use the inputted data to further train. So how can we know our data is safe and that we're using these systems ethically. Yeah, and I think, you know, to his point, to that that anonymous person's question, where we're seeing the biggest backlash right now is in art, right? So, you know, for example, on something like Mid Journey, you know, when, when you're asking it to create this, you know, let's say uh, a, a realistic painting of XYZ, whatever, you know, where did that, where did that training data come from, right? I mean, that those were probably images it found on the web sometimes without consent of those uh, authors and you know that that can be an issue for those artists i mean we're even seeing that now with the uh the author strike right now a big or the actor strike rather a big reason why actors are striking right now is because they don't want to be replaced by ai because you know ai can potentially do you know writing the scripts for the shows that we watch people even like backup uh you know background actors their voices can be copied and once you have their their voice they want to own that voice that, you know, background actors are never used again. Um, so, you know, I, I think with that, we're, we're definitely seeing a battle on the, the ethical side, for sure, of people's work and their labor being monetized without their consent or in a way that they're not getting a fair shake out of it. Um, and again, when you look at like tools like ChatGPT, you know, sometimes it's not really clear where that training data did come from and was that obtained ethically and in is, you know, can we really trust what we're putting in? I mean, from what we know from OpenAI, you know, what their claims are is that, you know, when we're interfacing with the AI and when we're communicating with it, they're not sharing that data and that data is not being used to train the model further. It's a closed model in that sense, right? Um, but yeah, no, I mean, I definitely think it, it can be very difficult. And this is kind of, I think, you know, lawmakers are way behind the ball in this field, right? So I, I think when it, whether it's deep fake technology, which could possibly impact elections, or whether it's, you know, all these AI tools that exist, there is a big moral and ethical dilemma that I don't I don't think there's a really an easy answer to to give in a few minutes here. Um, but I, you know, just what I would say is whatever tool you're going to use, I would just, you know, you need to have kind of that conversation internally within your organization is, are, are we comfortable using AI internally within our organization? Um, does, you know, does that go against what our ethics are? Or maybe this is okay because X, Y, Z. Um, but, you know, I mean, there, there's definitely legitimate concerns that I think are, are rated. I'm not thinking like, you know, Terminator take over the world type stuff. I think kind of more short term, what we're talking about, again, it's, it's you know, it's a labor issue. It's a, a, an, an issue of just people's work being stolen. It's It's, you know, kind of on a tangent there, but Rock, I'll kind of pass it off to you if you have anything you want to add on to that. I think it's an extremely important conversation to be having as as a society because, you know, the the mainstream public is just getting exposed to this technology. And I think to Jack's point, there's a there's a huge ethical consideration to be made, especially in things like the creative world, where um, you know, for any of these models, if they were used to train systems without, you know, the consent of authors, that is something absolutely that that needs to be looked at. I would say too, you know, if you're using AI in your systems, um, 
you definitely do want to revisit your privacy policy. That's definitely something we're seeing some of our clients, you know, have to think about where because they're using this new system that is interacting with customer data, um, you know, you absolutely want to make that clear to your users, uh, you know, just from a, a data governance standpoint. The other thing too is, you know, Jack kind of alluded to this as well, but you can, um, in your configuration for most AI systems, you know, request that the data that you're using uh, it for does not get used to train the larger scale model or specific systems. And so for enterprise users, that's obviously really uh, important. And I think like, you know, there, it goes without saying, I think it's, I think it's pretty obvious that there are going to be jobs that are displaced by AI. There's definitely going to be, you know, large swaths of the population that are just completely, you know, displaced by this in terms of what their occupation is. So you can imagine things like call centers and telemarketing will be completely automated in the future. We showed you that Santa example where you've got someone hyper-realistically talking and able to you know, converse with you in real time. You know, Large human-based call centers that are gonna be making calls just won't exist in the future. And so part of it, I think, is dealing with the structural changes that are associated with that, but then also deciding where some of the limits are. I think one thing we didn't really talk in detail about, but absolutely is something that's happening is the military is using AI for much more sensitive types of applications. So Palantir, a uh, large uh, military contracting company in the United States, actually created their own large language models that integrates with drones, where it can say, hey, you know, I'm a drone. Here are some data. Here's some data I found on the battlefield. I see our our uh, our enemy has a formation here in this valley. Should I should I do a drone strike? Yes or no? And so, you know, having things like that or guns that are attached to computer vision systems that can de detect if the enemy is crouching versus walking and, you know, how many tanks there are. There's definitely some serious ethical implications to using AI for warfare. And that's an extreme example, but um, it definitely is something that I think there should be a larger uh, discourse about for sure. And like any tool, I think it has the capability to be abused, but also the, the capability for some for some large scale good as well. Brock, thank you. Ed Tankus, I believe our tech council, you had a final observation. Yeah, just um, real quick, Ray, uh, the, the two big things in my mind that are are on the forefront right now, obviously, is there meetings of the, meetings of the mind of OpenAI, um, Elon Musk, and all, of, you know, all the heads of Google and Microsoft talking about where are we going with this? You know, what security, how we put in guardrails? You know, I think that's one of the foremost things um, that we're facing right now. And the second possibly foremost thing is as the person mentioned in the chat, is the ethics and where the data is coming from and who owns the data and the intellectual properties and those kinds of things. And these are things that at some point will probably take up in the tech council, maybe in a presentation, maybe an open discussion, maybe in a panel, possibly at the big connector elsewhere. Um, if these if these two things, particularly, or the other things you mentioned today are important, please get back to any of the people that are you know been on the panel you know, drop us an email at the chamber or whatever. I'd be happy to address that um, at some point. But uh, again, thank you everybody for your participation. Jack and Rock, thank you again. And uh, Ray, uh, back to you for your final. You bet, Ed, thank you so much. Joan Walker too, and the sponsorship of Unipen for this very vital technology council with our Greater New Haven Chamber of Commerce. Rock and Jack, if you can share your contact uh, information on our screen before we wrap things up. We wanna thank you both really for a excellent, presentation here today. And again, this will be on our YouTube page, uh, channel. You can go view this again. Uh, you all have access to this information. Uh, and, and it is important and vital that you learn everything at this point. Jack Marchese from Get Current AI, Rock Vitale from Easy. Thank you both. It's been an excellent presentation today. Uh, and, and we look forward to more conversations and presentations from you in the future. Thank you so much. Yeah, I hope a lot of people got a lot of value out of this presentation. Um, and yeah, feel free to email us, connect with us on LinkedIn, or, you know, however you want to communicate with us. Perfect. Jack and Rock, thank you so much. Thank you all for joining us here today at the Greater New Haven Chamber of Commerce. Our Technology Council will be bringing more information. For more information on all of the councils and all of the events with our chamber, go to gnhcc.com. Register for your booth for the Big Connect November 15th. And don't forget to stop by the North Haven Expo on the North Haven Green this coming Saturday from 11 to 4. I'm Ray Andrews, the Executive Director of the Quinnipiac Chamber of Commerce, the Affiliate Chamber for the Greater New Haven Chamber of Commerce. Thank you for joining us and have a great day.